So then the next thing that you are asked to do, I said, well, let's consider a number of different scenarios here. And say for each one of these scenarios, if rather than considering that objective probability, obviously there's an objective probability of each of these events happening, it may or may not be totally obvious to us what it is, but there is a probability out there. Then we're saying for our decision weight, remember that P versus pi of P or W of P, however you want to call that. For our subjective decision weight, are we going to overweight or underweight, or you know, I guess you could say neither if you really wanted to, each one of these following events. And so we want to think back to what we talked about in class about when we might overweight a probability, when we might underweight a probability, and so on. So what do you guys think? If we were going to say, let's consider the probability of getting struck by lightning. Is that something that you think we're likely to overweight or underweight? Overweight. Okay. How did you arrive at that? What was your reasoning? I, I agree with you. That's a, yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. You know, if I were to ask you, do you think the probability of getting struck by lightning is small, what would you say? <coughs> yeah. yeah, okay. We agree that that's small. But you seem to be saying both because we've been taught that it's something we should worry <coughs> about and also because it's somewhat of a salient thing. Like, we can see examples in, you know, the news, on the internet, whatever. We, you know, see people get struck by lightning. What you seem to be saying is that it's not so small that we would just round that to zero, maybe. Okay? Yeah, and that's what we talked about when we, you know, mentioned briefly the concept of availability bias last time. We said, well, if we're forming, you know, either our guesses about objective probabilities or if we're forming our subjective decision weights based on how easy it is to think of an example of this happening, if we have a situation where everybody's talking about it every time this happens, it's not entirely surprising that we might overweight how prevalent that actually is. we're going to think about the objective probability versus the decision weight. And we said, here's our 45 degree line. Here's what the world would look like if we were just mapping perfectly. We said if a probability is really small, we round it to zero. But we also said if a probability was small but not small enough to round to zero, then we tend to overweight it. Remember, we have this discontinuity here, and then the rest of our curve, you know, looks something like that, right? So, part of the, you know, part of the ambiguity here, and again, there's not necessarily a right answer and a wrong answer, but the discussion should be, well, what is the actual probability of getting struck by lightning? What do you think? I love her hand went up right away. She's like, oh, I know this one. I looked it up. Just theoretically, what is that probability at which we change from rounding to zero to overweighting it? Like we said close to zero, but <coughs> what is close to zero? That's it. I don't know. Um, so what's important to think about with the, with the paper that's introducing this model and saying, you know, it seems like in general we have this sort of um, mapping from objective probabilities to decision weights. It doesn't specifically say where <coughs> that might happen, right? And we could gather some, you know, experimental evidence, observational evidence, et cetera, to try to understand, right? But it might differ by situation. It might, it's, the authors especially didn't put a number on that. So it's something that we're not, I would say we're not quite sure where exactly that flip happens, which is why, you know, this is open to discussion, in, you know, to some degree, right? That we can all we can all agree that it's a reasonably low probability event. But if I were to say, is it low enough probability that we're going to round it to zero psychologically? I don't know. But the point of this exercise is to say, oh, that's what I'm thinking about. Now I have to make a guess one way or the other. As long as you're, you know, using this framework, that's really all I'm asking for. Okay.
and it seems like the consensus of the class, because most of you said that you would overweight it, is that yes, it's a small probability, but not so small that we just rounded it to zero. And that's a, yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, because we had one argument that we're told what to do if we're at risk of getting hit by lightning, and saying, well, that sort of environment might cause us to overweight in our decision-making process. You're saying the mere fact that it's become this colloquial term, getting struck by lightning, is something that never happens, that psychologically that might cause us to underweight. I think that's a very good point. And again, we're not sure exactly what side of that line we're on, but we start thinking about all of the different factors that could affect both our <coughs> internal probability estimates, but also the decision weights we're placing on those probabilities. Let's think about another one. So, you guys are reasonably young. I tried to fit, I tried to think about what would make sense in this, you know, for a set of examples. So, the decision weights on waking up tomorrow. So your event is waking up tomorrow. Overweight or underweight? Overweight. How did you arrive at that? Or you guys are optimistic. You're considering it close enough to one. Yeah. Notice that I literally couldn't come up with something. You know, think about what would a truly probability of one event be, right? As like the sun comes up tomorrow, I'm like, well, yeah, we're we're trending towards basically one, but in a very <laughs> literal sense, I couldn't think of anything with a probability for sure of one. We still don't know. What if there's that one magical person out there that that's, that's my point, that you get into this weird <laughs> philosophical territory, right? That I can say, yeah, you are probably right. My money would be on your side of that, that argument. But we technically don't know. Though we have, the, you know, we have this biological definition that it's actually by, you know, a biological rule that in order to be considered a living thing, you have to have a limited lifespan. It's kind of weird, but we technically don't know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, close, I'm trying to get as close to one as we can. Yeah. yeah. What we're saying here is, if we perceive this prob, you know, if we think this probability is one <coughs> or close enough to one, then the certainty effect kicks in, which is the point that I was trying to make. And the certainty effect caused us in our decision-making process to overweight those events that we saw happening with probability one. So yeah, I would agree with you here that, you know, I'm not surprised that the consensus is that we would overweight these events. But notice that this is actually sort of a helpful discussion because we're saying, you know, the pro we don't have anything where the probability is for sure literally one. Technically speaking, even in the situation that was given in the paper when we said, would you rather have $4,000 with probability, what was it, 0.8, or $3,000 with probability 1. Even in that case, I could argue that the probability wasn't truly 1, because there would be some chance that the person giving that offer would renege on the offer, and so on and so forth, right? So if we're going to apply this, well, technically, are you sure that that's actually going to happen? That wasn't even true for the original <coughs> question given to participants, but we can infer that they were perceiving it as close enough that the certainty effect kicked in, in the same way that it seems here reasonable enough that if we're really, really close to one, then the certainty effect would kick in as well. Okay. How would you, would you overweight or underweight the probability of sharing a birthday with somebody else in the class? Underweight. 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 Okay, how'd you get there? What is the chance? How do we even do that? I didn't ask the question, what is the probability of anybody sharing a birthday? I asked, an e what's actually an easier question, like you're saying, what is the probability of you sharing a birthday with somebody else? Let's assume for the sake of simplicity that every birthday is equally likely. That is not true. Um, fall birthdays are more common because apparently when people don't have anything better to do because it's really crappy and cold outside, 
they have sex, and then nine months later, babies pop out. So there's a there's a seasonal effect to it. Um, but just for the you know for the sake of simplicity, to say birthdays are uniformly distributed. Yeah, you'd have to do probably the easiest way to do it is one minus like you're saying the probability that you don't share a birthday with anybody. So what would that be? One minus what 364 over 365 to the 29th power. <laughs> I'm asking, well, people have laptops out in front of you, so I'm like, you know, put that in Excel or whatever. It's like 0 0.0765, okay. And I did that, I did this on purpose. Because this is an example where if you had to guess without going through the math, people tend to guess a much lower number than is actually true. Because you're like, sharing a birthday, like I don't know that many people, you know, it's not that likely that you know, if I think about one person, that I share a birthday with that one person. So you're like, oh, that seems like something kind of unlikely. And people sort of forget that as you're aggregating over a large group, that, you know, the probability increases in sort of like a not quite additive way or a not quite intuitive way. And so people typically underestimate the probability of this actually happening. In addition, and again, I'm trying to distinguish between, hey, you even got your objective probability wrong, right? That it's likely the case that people not only get that objective probability wrong, but then also, because it's in the middle of the spectrum here, even considering that objective probability, they likely underweight that when we're talking about a decision weight. Because we end up with a probability that is, you know, not small enough to round to zero, not even in this like very small range, certainly not one, that the probability we end up with is probably somewhere in this middle area here. Okay. How do we feel about the decision weights associated with being diagnosed with Alstrom syndrome. I hope I wouldn't have actually had to tell you to Google this, but I was just trying to make sure nobody felt stupid because if I just put it there, you're like, maybe that's something I'm supposed to know. And I, I purposely, I literally Googled like most rare diseases or something like that. Um, I don't claim to be an expert in, you know, biology, epidemiology, whatever that I specifically wanted an example and worked backwards from there. So I Google rare diseases, look at a few. I was like, oh, that one's not interesting enough. This one's not interesting enough. And then I came upon this one. Okay. So what do we think here? Well, it definitely Yeah, that that's what I was trying to get to. I was trying to say, like, are we in the point, you know, can I show you something where psychologically you say, yes, this is close enough to zero that from a decision weight sense, I will treat this as zero. And you seem to, you know, you seem to say, yeah, I'll treat that as zero. It's so rare, I don't care. Yeah, what do you think? I definitely think people, um, Now that I told you about it, maybe I'm like changing that, right? <laughs> like, oh, I read about all the symptoms, you know how you read about symptoms on the internet and you decide that you have every disease ever, right? <laughs> and so maybe you read about it and you're like, oh, maybe I can't, oh, you get like the, the hyper, your inner hypochondriac coming out or whatever, so I apologize if I did that to anybody. Probably because I told you to Google it, though. Yeah. That's, that's the interesting part here, that if I had literally just said here, rather than telling you to Google it, I had just said, look, this is a really rare disease. Only a few people have ever been diagnosed with it. I probably even in my framing and the information I provided to you changed your minds a little bit. Right, because then you wouldn't have gone to the you know, WebMD, the, you know, the disease flowchart, everything leads to cancer or whatever that you wouldn't have it be as salient in your mind. That, and again, you know, not everyone is going to behave the same way, that that's kind of the point, that we understand that we have these general rules and say, you know, if a probability is really small, people are more likely to round that to zero. It might be the case that, you know, each individual person has a different break point here that we can affect this break point by how salient we're making something seem, the way we're providing information, et cetera. Right? So it's not surprising that there's not complete agreement about what you would do here. But again, you're using these general concepts
that we can at least start having that debate rather than you just having to guess randomly. Right, and we, you know, we generally think about traditional economics, we assume that the rational individual does some sort of, you know, Bayesian reasoning, right, and says, well, okay, you know, those are like those typical, you know, like the brain teaser problems, you have this test, and it's 99% accurate, what is the chance, given that you test positive, that you actually have the disease, and intuitively people are pretty bad at that, because they're, they're doing what we would consider base rate neglect is the technical term, that they're not thinking about how rare something is in the population. And in the, in the same way here, when you start reasoning from symptoms, you can get into those same logical fallacies, especially since, it specifically says, for example, childhood obesity is a symptom of the disease, not a cause of the disease. So the fact that we have an increased prevalence of childhood obesity doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have an increased prevalence of this disease because of that causal mechanism, but again, people aren't necessarily good at reasoning in that way. <coughs> so you start thinking about you know, all the different things that can come in because eventually we're getting to some sort of descriptive model of how people are making decisions in risky environments or how people are making choices about risk. And what we're showing here is that we have two things potentially happening on the, you know, the probability side. We have people aren't even necessarily good at understanding what those objective probabilities are. And then we also have them not necessarily psychologically taking a probability of one third as a probability of one third, for example. So we have almost two steps happening here before we get to this decision weight that we're assigning. And not surprisingly, if people are consistently overweighting or underweighting a probability or consistently over or underestimating that objective probability, that we're going to see systematic deviations from rationality in our behavior. That's sort of the point that we're making here. Okay. So I think, if I'm understanding you guys correctly, I, in fact, did come up with something that at least many of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you are considering, fine, you've finally shown me something that's small enough that I'm rounding that to zero in my decision-making process. 